You're listening to Nearly Numinous, a podcast all about the religious side of life. Every week we chat about different religions, spiritualities, and other beliefs. We do roundtable discussions, deep dives into histories and religious studies theories, and interview different religious leaders or practitioners. For full transcripts and more information on each episode, you can find us at nearlynuminous.ca. Welcome to this week's episode of Nearly Numinous. Today we're talking all about the latest hot topic, which is manifestation. So this includes the term law of attraction or manifestation, and these two terms have seemed to jump into popularity over the last 10 years or so, um, but even more within this past year. So today we're going to talk all about this new fad, but we're going to go in depth on where it actually comes from and why it's such a popular topic these days. Let's first start by explaining what manifestation or law of attraction really is. Law of attraction is the belief that your mindset will attract your lifestyle. So this means that if you have a negative thought, then it will bring about a negative experience. The concept basically states that if you want to live your best life, then all you need to do is keep a positive mindset and it will create some sort of positive energy that will attract these good things into your life. Manifestation is the the idea that you can use the law of attraction or also commonly referred to as LOA to create your ideal lifestyle. Ways to manifest include visualization either in your head or using a vision board, asking for help or guidance from the universe or your higher power, writing down your goals such as in a gratitude or intention journal, manipulating your energy to be more focused and receptive to good things coming in your way, and repeating your manifestations and affirmations over and over. To put in more simple and concrete terms, for instance, if you want to be rich, then think about yourself and picture yourself being rich. By doing this, the universe will give you this wealth and abundance. Many of these concepts are solidified into new age thought, where the universe or cosmos or even God will favor your goals if you, quote unquote, put it out into the universe. So while looking into the subject, what I found really interesting is, and I want to hear your guys' thoughts on this too, is like this inherent physical, psychological, and spiritual connection that it seems humans have with the universe in this philosophy. Um... So not only are humans in tune with a sort of divine power, but they can also harness it for their own benefit. And I was wondering if this is an ability that's unique to humans or if other sentient beings can do it too. Um, I mean, supposedly animals would have to be able to do some of the things we aren't sure they're fully capable of, like, you know, hold long-term goals and visualize them too. So um, I looked it up, and honestly, I couldn't find much about it. But one person pointed out that as the law of attraction is, in their view, a universal law, then of course it would apply to animals. And some people were saying maybe it applies to plants too but maybe it just works differently for them since they're more instinctual and emotional than supposedly humans are. But, like, what do you guys think? I mean, maybe we can talk about this a bit later once we learn more about law of attraction, but do you guys think that law of attraction would apply to animals and maybe even plants? I think that it's hard to make a solidified decision on that just because, like you said, we have no clue what animals are fully capable of, um, including things like holding long-term goals, right? Um, But I think even just going beyond that, we are really positive on if animals have some sort of religious belief system either, right? So if they view themselves as part of kind of a larger system or if they're very, you know, short-term goal and oriented, you know what I mean? So yeah, I guess to answer your question, I I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, one of the people on this message board was saying, like, they also believe that um, 
cells are uh, subject to the law of attraction as well. So it doesn't mean you have to be conscious, it just means you have to be alive to be subject to this universal law. So I thought that was a really cool idea. Yeah, I guess from like, I, if you're looking at the law of attraction, and I guess we'll get into this a little bit more later, if you're looking at law of attraction as strictly a psychological belief system, um, or like a psychological or scientific f fact, I guess, when you get into like placebo and things like that, then I would say like, no. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're looking at it from this kind of idea of metaphysics, where it is a law of attraction. So yeah, you're right. Like if the idea is that, you know, I can attract certain things by changing my cell structure and my cell structure will respond to certain energies and you get into that like metaphysics part, then yeah, you're right. Like anything with cells could technically be part of this. Uh, we're going to get into that topic of metaphysics versus like psychology and science a little bit more later. I guess maybe before we get into that kind of does the law of attraction work or not debate, um, we should first talk about like why we're talking about this in the first place. So this is something that we've heard from our listeners that they want more explicitly stated. Like, why are we talking about this? Why does this relate to religion? Why is this interesting to us, right? And so I think that you'll see as we go along throughout the episode how integrated into religious thought and philosophy this is. But I think even like we've already mentioned that we talk about like a higher power, whether that be a god or a deity or, you know, the quote unquote greater universe. But I think that it's, I mean, obviously it tied into spirituality and you're seeing this a lot more with like the contemporary spirituality community that, you know, they're really into making vision boards and it's become kind of synonymous with this new, I, I don't want to use the term new age um, because we're going to talk about what new age actually is, but it, like contemporary, I guess, broad spirituality that a lot of people are participating in. So you see, you know, girls on YouTube or Instagram or whatever, they're pulling tarot cards, they're meditating and doing yoga, and now vision boards and manifesting are part of that identity. So I think that's quite an interesting fact, and I thought it'd be interesting to explore this more. Like, where is the roots of this? Um, where is, like, why do we care about this? Is this tied to religious traditions? Like, something like yoga is, we all know that's tied to a religious tradition, whether or not it's the same, that's a different debate. But, you know, is manifesting tied to an original religious tradition, or is this, like, a new thing? So we're going to talk a lot about the historic nature of it. We're also going to talk a lot about, like, once we kind of go through the history and what is manifestation, etc., we're going to get a little bit into the idea of spiritual bypassing and how this fits into this. So uh, I personally have seen this term come up a lot in the past year um, because the idea of promoting manifestation or law of attraction can really often diminish people's real lived experience and the barriers they face daily that are not necessarily in their own control. So for example, I had never really heard the term spiritual bypassing until uh, like the social media blackout and the rise of the 2020 specific Black Lives Matter movement. And this term specifically came up when it was in relation to the intersectional feminist movement because women of color are often told that they can control their future through law of attraction. And maybe it's not so explicitly as I just put it, but it's definitely kind of in that realm. And you know, even just, like, bringing in that mentality of, like, if you're poor, you can become rich just by willing that into existence. And it doesn't necessarily bring into the fact that, okay, maybe you're not rich because in order to get rich, you have to make money. And in order to make money, you have to get a job. And in order to get a job, you have to have certain qualifications, etc. Right? Like, a lot of this comes from the fact that, you know, when white women specifically often face their oppression and they try to combat their oppression, they can use things like law of attraction because oftentimes in the 21st century workplace, like women, like white women have more of a voice than I think historically. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, as a white woman, I feel like I can speak to that. Um, so I think it's not as simple as like, hey, I don't have a voice, therefore I can't even speak up for what I want. 
So it's always like, well, it's a mindset shift, it's being a boss, things like that, whereas it's not necessarily the case for non-white women, you know? Does that all make sense? I feel like that was a very... Yeah. Okay. No, I get that. Like, there are more, like, no, I get it. Like, there are uh, a lot more, like, systemic barriers that can prevent, like, women of color, for example, from reaching their their goals, whereas white women have uh, this certain level of privilege to be able to move around in the world, to be able to, I guess, like, quote-unquote, attract things via, you know... Now I now I don't know what I'm saying. Well, I think you already said that far more eloquently than I did. Um, and I think I, when it comes down to it, I think we're going to get a little bit more into this topic near the end of the episode and go more in depth, kind of once we have an idea of what law of attraction and manifestation really is. Um, but ultimately, I guess to sum it up, it's the fact that when it comes to dangerous systems of oppression it really diminishes like using something like the law of attraction or manifestation or encouraging other people to use that. It really diminishes the actual real barriers that people face. And it kind of makes it seem like it's just some mental, mental thing that you need to get over, which is not the case. So we'll talk a bit more in depth about that later. Um, but also, okay, going back to like why we thought this was interesting and wanted to talk about it, I just, uh, I think we want to manifest our podcast being successful and great for the rest of the year. You know? And we'd love so it this if is you us guys could also manifest that for us, too. Yeah, manifest that for you us know, by subscribing down, to our podcast. Board, do all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That would be great, yeah. Okay, I feel like we keep talking about vision boards um, and, like, ways to manifest. So maybe we'll give, like, a quick overview of different ways to manifest. One of the big ones is creating a vision board or, like, creative envisioning, I guess. I don't remember what the official term is, but it's basically the idea, like, you can do it. People do it all different ways. Some people will just, like, meditate on an image. So they'll picture themselves with, you know, their greatest desire whether that's, you know, I'm going to picture myself getting this job, I'm going to envision myself in this job. Um, So it's kind of like you picture yourself already achieving those goals. So some people, again, just do this mentally. Some people actually will create, like, they'll get a poster board and do, like, a collage, sort of. So they'll cut out pictures and images of the things they want. So if they want a beach house, they would print out a picture of a beach house or find one in a magazine and cut it out and put it on this board. Uh, Some people kind of just journal about it, but the vision board seems to be like the big one. Um, And part of that is kind of the idea that you envision it and then you have a physical, like you put it next to your desk or something so that you have like a visual reminder every single day that those are the goals you're working towards um, so that you can continue to manifest it and put it out into the universe because your mind's always on it. You're remembering, you're constantly seeing it over and over again. So that's the basic of a vision board. I feel like Pinterest would be a really good tool to, you know, use vision boards and manifestation. Yeah, I've seen people who do, they have like a Pinterest board that says they're like 2021 vision board, and then they save all the images to that Pinterest board. Nice. Yeah. If so, I've been manifesting for years. Right, (laughs) yeah. So would the mirror of Irised then be the magical version of a vision board? Definitely. (laughs) I was thinking that, but I couldn't remember the name of it, so I didn't want to say it. (laughs) Yeah, I was thinking, I had to think, how do you say that backwards? How do you say desire backwards? Yeah. That's the mirror in the first Harry Potter book and movie, right? Yeah. Okay. So I feel like, though, it would be kind of hard to to manifest your parents back to life. Yeah, no, that would be very, very difficult um, Mm -hmm. to do. Well, Except if you have the resurrection stone, which he eventually gets. But yeah, they're still not alive. Because um, they're just like. We always end up talking about Harry Potter. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's because my world through Can you tell Harry we're Potter. millennials? <laughs> <laughs> it's very millennial of us. It is, yeah. <laughs> All right, shall we go into the history now? Let's give the, the listeners a good idea of what 
is manifestation and law of attraction and where does it even come from? Yeah, so we're going to jump around a little bit uh, throughout history today, mostly starting in the early 19th century and then moving to uh, the contemporary era. So to give you some more concrete context, well, first, we're first going to talk about The Secret. So The Secret is both a book as well as a documentary. When The Secret was released, it sparked a new desire to learn about these manifestation philosophies. The book and the documentary were both spearheaded by Rhonda Byrne, but it was primarily popularized by the support it gained from people like Oprah Winfrey, Ellen DeGeneres, and Larry King, making it less of a subculture and bringing it more into the mainstream. The Secret and all of the philosophies within it were directly influenced by the 1910 book, The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace Waddles. This book was part of the New Thought Movement, which started in the early 19th century, and the book inspired many other elements of the New Age and New Thought Movements. We'll get into those a bit later on. The New Thought Movement promoted the interactions between consciousness, belief, thought, etc., and how those things affected the human mind and human body. This stemmed out into beliefs about self-healing, law of attraction, creative visualization, and personal power. This movement is said to have started by Phineas Quimby uh, in the early 1800s. He was a mesmerist and healer, and many of his philosophies perceived illness as originating in the mind due to mindset. So listeners may recognize the term mesmerism from a previous episode. As a refresher, mesmerism, also known as animal magnetism or hypnosis, is a movement named after German doctor Franz Mesmer, who believed that all living things possessed an invisible natural force. By properly directing the flow of this energy, or electricity, Mesmer believed that a practitioner could encourage acts of healing. Quimby practiced mesmerism, but came to the conclusion that that his patients were healed not by mesmerism itself, but by the suggestion of healing. He developed the philosophy that disease is caused by false belief, and if you're open to what he called the truth, then you could be cured of any ailment. This theory went on to inspire beliefs like Christian science, which we'll get into more later, but this is also where a lot of the ideas of manifestation started. It also inspired Wallace Waddles to look at Quimby's philosophies and find ways to use it beyond healing from illness. That's where the science of getting rich was born. No longer was this just a theory that can be used for healing, but now you could use these ideas to bring into being anything you could possibly want. One of the core principles of the science of getting rich is the fact that individuals need to develop their own manifestation practices rather than focus on competition with others. That's the only way to be successful and is the way towards wealth. Waddles was also heavily inspired by the idea of creative visualization, which we talked about a bit earlier, which includes vision boards. And Pinterest. And Pinterest. (laughs) This idea of um, avoiding competition as well as comparison um, is quite interesting, especially if you think about like feminist movements and how uh, for women historically and even up to today um like our wages like there's this kind of unspoken understanding that people aren't supposed to talk about the specifics of their wages which has often led to women getting paid less because um like they're less likely to ask for raises um you know ask their their uh their their men co-workers you know like what are you what are you earning for this exact same amount of work. So this is interesting to me that this philosophy seems to be picked up a lot by women and how that how it continues to reinforce some of these systemic uh, barriers and, and inequalities. Mm-hmm. It's interesting, though, because I feel like you can look at it two different ways, right? So like you can look at it that way for sure, where it's like, well, it's not competition. You just need to like work hard. You need to manifest a better raise, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, if you look towards um, the fact that women are often very, like they're placed in competition to one another and it's, you know, you see it not as much with, I think, as our generation, but maybe with the generation above us where you see a lot of these women who like 
we're putting each other down so that they can get ahead, right? To put it simply. Um, and this kind of thing can maybe also inspire people to be like, oh, you know what? No, I don't actually need to be in competition because we're not in competition. We're both trying to succeed. Um, so I think there's kind of like two sides to that, you know? Mm -hmm. So the New Thought movement also inspired and later worked in tandem with the New Age movement. Much like New Thought, the New Age movement comes from a variety of different influences that start as early as ancient Gnosticism, which is from the first century and even earlier, and, and incorporates later philosophies such as Freemasonry, ritual magic, and the occult. But one of the most prominent philosophies that New Age grew from was Theosophy. So Theosophy was a movement led by Helena Blavatsky, also known as Madame Blavatsky. She was a Russian philosopher from the mid-1800s. She immigrated to the U.S., where she wrote most of her, her work about theosophy around the mid to late 1800s. Fun fact, she's actually the first known person to use the term law of attraction in print. I should do an aside there, though. Um, I have read, though, that many people use, like, Madame Bl Blavatsky wasn't necessarily talking about law of attraction in the way that we currently understand it. She was referring it to more as, like, gravity. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a little unclear on the specifics of that. That is a critique I've seen come up a lot from theosophists that say that a lot of these contemporary spiritual but not religious folks that use things like law of attraction, they'll be like, oh, well, M Madame Blavatsky loved it and she wrote about it, but it's, it's kind of a bit different, just to clarify. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Gravity as in, like, something in the air that you throw in the air is attracted to the ground? I think so. It was a little unclear. I only found, like, the basic critiques online of that. Um, I couldn't find, like, more detailed nuances. I'm sure I haven't read Blavatsky's work, which I'm sure if I, like, d dove deep into it, I could figure out some of those things. Um, but, you know, there's only, only so many hours in a day. There's you just can you can't read everything <laughs> so what i do know though is that in her book the secret doctrine which is one of the things that she wrote that for theosophy um it really emphasized the individual's ability to shape their own reality and move past like their own limitations um so that being said you know like the law of attraction in the contemporary understanding kind of fits into like what she was promoting in the secret doctrine so theosophy isn't a word that kind of gets thrown around in everyday conversation, so we should probably go into like what it means a little bit. So f first, it's important to note that uh, theosophists don't consider themselves a religious movement, but many scholars of religion have found enough similarities to other religious movements to be able to consider it one. But because they don't consider themselves an official religion, they often have members that are part of other religious traditions as well, including Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Confucianism. The philosophies are predominantly based in Western esotericism and occultism, but a lot of it is tied to, quote, ancient religions in an attempt to revive ancient esotericism and so-called authentic truths. Blavatsky believed that all ancient religions had a sort of secret doctrine that was only known to a select few, such as Plato or Hindu sages. She said that these philosophies underpin every single, comp every single contemporary religious tradition. Basically, to sum it up in as short a time as possible, it's the belief that a knowledge of God can be achieved through spiritual ecstasy, direct intuition, or special individual relations. One of the guiding principles is that the purpose of human life is the emancipation of the soul. The, the, the Theosophy logo says there is no religion higher than truth and contains a swastika, pre-Hitler edition, uh, the Om symbol, the Star of David, a snake, and the Ankh, which is a, an Egyptian symbol that signifies life. They believe that there are a group of people called masters that have advanced knowledge and spiritual intuition. These masters, at their origin in the 19th century, were believed to be located in Tibet. These masters also included people like Jesus, Abraham, Moses, Buddha, Confucius, and more. 
And some other interesting beliefs are that they encouraged chastity even within marriage and that they believed in reincarnation. Theosophy is even credited for spreading the idea of reincarnation throughout the West. That's interesting. I don't know if that's relevant. I just thought those were interesting facts. I was like, you promote chastity even within marriage? Interesting. <laughs> anyway. So, to kind of provide you a link, why is this important to the rise of the New Age movement? And later, why is this important to things like manifestation and law of attraction? So, the writings of Blavatsky are considered extremely influential on the New Age movement because her work and the works done by later philosophers to theosophy were used to disseminate the esoteric philosophies of the East into the West. So, things like general Hindu philosophies, um, for example, yoga and reincarnation, they were kind of seen to put that out and spread that widely throughout the Western identity. Um, but ultimately, at its core, theosophy helped to bring about the modern esoteric movement, which is one of the core elements of the New Age movement. So what is esotericism? If you think back to our first episode on the Enneagram, then you'll know what esotericism is all about. It's predominantly secret knowledges or secret meanings. The term comes from the Greek eso, meaning within, as opposed to exo, which means outside. So that's kind of, you have to be within the inner circle to get that kind of secret knowledge. Part of Madame Blavatsky's theosophy was a belief in the coming of what she called the New Age. This age promised a period of brotherhood and enlightenment guided by the destiny of the planets. So it's kind of like astrology, but it wasn't necessarily called explicitly astrology. And it's not as, you know, star signs and stuff that we talk about today. So once Madame Blavatsky died, others came in to succeed her and to continue on her philosophies and belief systems. So there's still a Theosophical Society in America today that you can go on their website and read all about them. But one of the most interesting successors that I found uh, was the idea of the triangle being spiritual. So Alice A. Bailey, who founded the Arcane School, established a triangles program with a capital T, which called people to come in and meditate in groups of three. So Bailey and her participants believed that by doing this, they received an advanced divine energy that would be shared amongst them, ultimately raising their quote-unquote spiritual awareness. After the death of Alice A. Bailey, many people from the Arcane School created a more broad and expansive spiritual and theosophical group, which kind of began the massive New Age movement because these groups spread drastically. So these people all laid the groundwork for the New Age by promoting ideas of spirituality and cosmological significance. But the idea of the quote-unquote New Age didn't come into being as we currently know it until the 1970s and 80s. While some scholars see it as a movement, so others see it more as a zeitgeist or a spirit of the time, as so much of its orientation had to do with preparing for the new millennium and the hope that after the, the year 2000, the world would become better and more enlightened than it had been previously. This temporal focus is one of the differences between the New Age and the spiritual but not religious movement, which, which has a lot of the same influences. The contemporary New Age movement was solidified in the 1970s by theosophist David Spangler. He ultimately believed that certain cosmological and astrological changes had released significant new waves of spiritual energy. Where this becomes highly relevant to today's main theme, manifestation, is that he believed that people could tap into this new spiritual energy in order to manifest the new era. This was extremely human-centered, as opposed to earlier people such as Blavatsky and Bailey, who, believe, who believed that humans were at the will of the cosmos. So moving back towards, you know, the secret and the modern age and kind of, or the contemporary age. So moving back more towards the release of the secret in the early 2000s and even kind of what we talk about in 2021 we can kind of look to like the 1990s. So by the 1990s, the idea of the new age had kind of lost its momentum. That might be just because of a lack of interest. It also might be because the new age was very time specific, as Jacqueline kind of just said. But part of it was also because once it started adopting things like crystals and tarot cards, people seemed less inclined to join up. 
Critics focused heavily on its unscientific ideas and practices, and it kind of made it so that people were less interested in looking into it, and they felt it was maybe more, you know, quote-unquote, occult-ish. And, you know, if you look back to some of the previous episodes we recorded, a lot of people were very critical of occult movements because they saw it as being satanic, which we've already explained is not true. (laughs) Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that we've just really replaced the term new age with the term spiritual but not religious um to me it seems kind of like the same thing but Jacqueline you were saying that there's maybe a couple of differences there yeah I think uh, I think it's largely a generational thing is kind of what I've I've noticed I could be wrong though um but yeah I think this this focus on working towards something specific working towards this new age isn't really present in the spiritual but not religious movement um Those were kind of my observations. I feel like growing up, I kind of just only heard about new agey stuff in like a negative way. Like people kind of spoke about it with derision. Like I think maybe part of it was about the occult stuff, but a lot of it was because like it wasn't backed up by science. And these days, like we really praise being able to scientifically back up everything. So people who use crystals um, and tarot and like, you know, are super new agey uh, just kind of seem like, or we're kind of framed as out there and, you know, not up to date with, you know, fact. So it kind of just has carried negative connotations in my view. Maybe that's why we're kind of talking about it in terms of spiritual but not religious, or maybe that's why New Age has kind of just gone out of style in general as a term. I feel like New Age as an idea is still used, but I feel like the term more often used is the term woo, which is exceptionally Mm. condescending. Um, And I really don't like that term, but it's something, it's a term that I hear a lot in other podcasts that talk about spirituality. And as I was, I was saying this to Steph a little bit earlier, but I really dislike that term because um, as we said in a previous episode, the new age largely covers uh, or includes these esoteric movements, which have their roots in other cultural traditions. And so by having this condescending term woo describe other traditions that we have commodified um, and taken advantage of in this in this way just really diminishes them in quite an orientalist uh, way that we talked about orientalism recently as well but it's just ah I just really don't like that word view, that word woo is it like you know if something's crazy something's like woo woo yeah okay Yeah, well, because even, like, the term itself doesn't pretend to be anything but condescending, right? Like, you'd never say, like, oh, that person's woo-woo without, like, meaning that in a condescending way to begin with, right? And very often you'll say it it in a slightly different tone. So, like, oh, like, Rachel, she's really, she's into things that are woo, you know? Like, you'll say it in a slightly different tone. If I had a dime for every time I heard that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, exactly, right? Yeah. Um, I think, though, okay, like, maybe to provide a different perspective of why New Age hasn't really, it's not as common of a term, I think part of it also comes into the fact that New Age was called that because it was a unique movement. Now it seems to be pretty widespread in our culture. Like, I can name tons of people like I I wouldn't even be able to create a list because it'd be so long of people that participate in quote-unquote new age belief systems Mm -hmm. and not necessarily from like a whole entity like it's not necessarily a overarching defining religious belief um but it's more so like just practices right so like people incorporating things like tarot or meditation or yoga or astrology or manifestation all of those things seem to be so common in our society now that like you don't really need a term to call it that right like it's just that person's spiritual Mm -hmm. period end of sentence right or they just that person likes to do tarot readings 
and you just ended at that. You wouldn't necessarily call it like new age, you know? So anyway, shall we uh, go back to the secret a bit more? So like we said, uh, the secret was what kind of really put new age into the pop culture realm and got it to be so popular with people like Oprah and Ellen DeGeneres, people like that. But when it comes to the actual movie, there were about 55 different teachers and authors interviewed for this film. So clearly this is a pretty widespread movement prior to this, but actually only about 24 are used in the final edition of the film. Uh, fun fact, there were actually 25, but then, oh, what's her name? Crap. This is gonna bother me now. Okay, anyway, one of the teachers asked to be removed from it. So clearly there was a little bit of controversy there. All right, so the 55 teachers and authors that were interviewed for this film are referred to in the movie and even beyond that, uh, secret teachers. So it really amps up that kind of esoteric and uh, occult vibe. Even the marketing for the film was extremely secretive, giving kind of teasers and trailers that didn't show any actual real information. So in order to receive this secret knowledge, you had to actually watch the movie itself, which seemed quite interesting to me because if you're trying to kind of make this esoteric, by creating a movie about it, you kind of ruin that esoteric element. But that seems to be pretty common in, like, the 21st century because we were talking about, like, the Enneagram as being occult knowledge. But also, that's widely available now. Yeah, I feel like that's kind of just what happens when consumerism gets involved with, like, you know, spiritual stuff. Like, it starts to become commodified yeah. and maybe even loses some of its, uh, like value or authenticity or it just gets changed for the purposes of being sold yeah. to people yeah for sure but anyway side fact i thought that was interesting and we should talk about it so fun fact i don't know if you knew this but last summer in july 2020 a movie was released that was inspired by the secret have you heard of this yet because i didn't know this until nope this morning. So this movie was uh, released last year and it starred Katie Holmes and uh, the movie was a complete flop. Absolutely terrible. Nobody watched it. Nobody promoted it. Critics said that it was not worth watching. Uh, so I don't know. I haven't seen it because again, like I said, I just heard about this this morning, but I'm, I'm now very curious. I, I might check it out later. <laughs> anyway, let's go back to the, the, the first secret movie that actually wasn't a complete flop. So the popularity of The Secret has been slowly building into the 2021 vision boards and manifestation gurus that we hear about across pop culture today. Much like tarot cards, meditation, and yoga, the ideas of law of attraction is now so solidified into popular culture that many people have no idea what the roots are. We've talked about the origins of manifestation and the law of attraction as part of the New Age and the New Thought movements, but does law of attraction have roots in other religious beliefs? So many New Age blogs talk about how the beliefs come from Christian, Buddhist, or Hindu teachings, but is that founded? There are a lot of online articles about if the law of attraction can coexist within Christianity, and it could be interesting to look at the different opinions on fate versus free will when it comes to the Abrahamic religions. Yeah, I think, Jacqueline, you had kind of mentioned earlier, and it got me thinking about the fact that we we use prayer as a way of manifestation, but there's kind of this like disconnect there with when you pray, you're not necessarily manifesting something, but you are in a way. Because if you're praying, you're asking God, which can be kind of seen as, you know, the spiritual new age religion as being, you know, the universe to kind of grant you certain blessings. Yeah. But then it's, it's the going back to that fate versus free will thing, right? Because like, if you are like, predestined for certain things, then manifestation doesn't fit into that. But if you can pray and ask God to bless you with certain things, then that kind of is manifestation, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, um, for, uh, a lot of education for Christian children kind of starts with this idea of, you know, the laundry list prayer where you ask God for specific things, like maybe a, a bicycle for Christmas or things like that. But then, um, yeah. or as m more wholesome, you know, bless this meal, uh, <laughs> but like, let's heal be real. my family member, you know, but kids are praying for new bikes. Yeah. Well, like 
probably the majority of prayers about uh, material possessions. I think that just tends to happen with a lot of children. Uh, but then, yeah, then they grow older or things happen in their lives, like uh, family members get sick. And that kind of is called into question about the value of it. And then um, what I've seen a lot is this, this emphasis on, well, no, prayer isn't about necessarily asking for specific things for God to grant them to you. But it can also be about um, working on yourself so that the changes that you would you would like can then be embodied in you and then you can um, help bring about that change in your life as well. And so it's just kind of like indirect. It's like God's not necessarily granting you these things, but God is because it's through you. And so it's this kind of, I would say it's very much in the same lines as this this manifestation uh, philosophy that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we can even go back to um, most of the people involved in the rise of like new age and new thought movements uh, were often Christians, whether or not they changed their religion um, or changed their belief system after working more in these philosophies. I mean, that's kind of hit or miss. But I think that's why, too, when you read about the New Age and stuff like that, a lot of it kind of comes from Christian mysticism, specifically. Um, and I feel like if we started talking about that, we could be here for another few hours. But maybe maybe we should do a, a different episode on mysticism itself. But I think even when you look at, um, like, Quimby, for example, uh, who we talked about a few minutes ago in relation to the New Thought movement part of his belief system was that you could kind of cure your body through just well-intentioned thoughts. Um, But Quimby himself was actually quite Christian, based on what I've read about him anyway. And so a lot of his ideas kind of got brought more into certain very interesting Christian communities. And he actually inspired the Christian science faith group, which at its core is still a, a Christian offshoot, I guess, so to speak. I don't know if that'd be the right term for it. But the Christian science movement is very big on the fact that in order to heal yourself, all you have to do is pray and ask God to heal you. So Christian science itself is kind of like, I feel like it's one of like the OG manifestation religions, (laughs) I guess. I guess like a switch on that is rather than law of attraction finding its roots in like a certain religion like Christianity, I think like um, other contemporary uh, spiritual movements like um, like contemporary witchcraft uh, can find its roots in law of attraction. So um, first of all, I want to say like my knowledge of witchcraft in general is pretty limited. Uh, I haven't really studied it in a formal way, but I do have witch friends, and I have also, like, dabbled a little bit in it, Um, but if you really want to see examples of manifestation in witchcraft, a really good place to go is TikTok, actually. Um, You can find tons and tons of witches on there who are showing you how to manifest certain things, whether it's, like, you know, money, a new house, uh a text from your boyfriend, that sort of thing. Um, you can find, like, text lots from of... your boyfriend. Out of it. <laughs> Sometimes you just gotta wish really hard for that sort of thing, and it's just not happening. So, you know, you gotta use these... You gotta go to TikTok to ha- find these strategies to manifest stuff. It's really interesting. There's a wide <laughs> variety of stuff out there. Uh, but for witches in particular, a lot of the practices are the same with other followers of Law of Attraction. So, like journals and affirmations, for instance, but um, performing spells and rituals uh, is also one of the ways that uh, witches practice manifestation. You can also, like, carry crystals. Uh, If you don't know about crystals, they're supposed to all have different meanings and are said to emit vibrations and channel your energy in different ways such that your physical, mental, and spiritual well-being is affected. What about like um, like the difference of white and black magic? Because I know that has something to do with attraction as well. Would you? I don't know enough to like speak on that. But I really don't know much don't about either. that. Of just like not wanting to attract the the bad stuff, 
like that by putting out curses you will then attract um, yeah so things back to yourself i think from what i've seen a lot of witches will say that if you put positive things out into the world if you're you know doing spells and writing sigils for positive reasons then you know it will come back upon you uh, threefold. I think we actually might have talked about this in our witchcraft episode, which is one of the first few that we did. But if you're, you know, putting negative stuff out in the world, if you're, you know, cursing people, then that's also going to reflect back on you. Kind of like the, um, the concept of karma. Interesting. Yeah, so I think, um, it's, it does seem to be that, like, the idea of manifestation and law of attraction is, like, not a new thing. It's something that is around for a ton of different religious beliefs and contemporary religious beliefs. And I think it's interesting to kind of go back to, like, I was mentioning with theosophy that it, you don't have to identify as a theosophist. You can be a Christian who agrees with theosophy so you know you could be a christian that uses manifestation or law of attraction in your own way um and i think even going back to like the ideas that this is a very individual thing it's not about competition it's not about what other people have to show you with it it's it's like a personal journey i guess so it kind of works with like whatever way you want it to work so to speak i even think i just side note with that i've never seen like somebody who does promote law of attraction from even just like a pop culture standpoint i've never seen someone like that really be like nitpicky about like oh you're doing it wrong like most people are just like oh you, you just you visualize you do it how you want to do it you meditate how you want to meditate you journal how you want to journal so that's true like even if there are certain strategies out there it doesn't seem as like clear-cut like you have to follow these specific rules to manifest mm -hmm. exactly now I think we should maybe kind of go back to what we talked about at the beginning with spiritual bypassing, um, because now we I think we have a bit more of a concrete idea of what uh, manifestation and law of attraction is and how people have used it throughout history. And this is definitely, like I said, a term that seems to be coming up more and more in recent days. Um, I don't know where the origins of the concept of spiritual bypassing come from, but I really have only heard of it within the past year. I don't know if you guys have heard of it earlier. I heard Not about it from you, so. Yeah. Yeah, so I think this is a pretty new concept that we're talking about anyway. Obviously, it's not a new concept in general. Um, so, at the beginning of the episode, we did mention that spiritual bypassing, in a very short description, is when you use spirituality to explain away any real feelings or real experiences. So, for example, I've, like, I've heard this done in not just necessarily like the spiritual but not religious world, but I've heard it by people saying, you know, God has a plan, you know, or whatever variation on that God slash any deity has a plan for you. Or kind of saying things like the, the universe has your back or your future is up to the universe. Um, so in the realm of manifestation and law of attraction, this can be more specifically when you say something like, oh, you just need to shift your mindset and you'll become rich or you'll heal yourself. So I think you hear this a lot more specifically with people with mental illness that, well, if you're depressed, you just need to not be depressed. Mm -hmm. Shift your mindset and you'll cure yourself of your mental illness just or think happy any thoughts. variation of mental health right exactly right and so that kind of fits into this as well right and i think this very much diminishes like the real experiences that people are having you know if you have severe anxiety you can't just stop having it you know like of course yes your mentality can definitely shift some parts of it but like it's not a catch-all for everybody right like there's some people that yeah like you're just your brain is overthinking and you just need to stop. No big deal. But for the majority of people, it's not just like, oh, shift your mindset and you'll be cured. <laughs> so I think it's important to recognize that as much as manifestation can help people, it's not a catch-all. It's not the answer for everything. Um, you know, like a lot of times it is completely innocent and it is a good way to help yourself get over some hard times. 
by using this mentality shift, you know? Um, but for, for people who are having actual, like, real long-term struggles or real long-term systems of oppression, it's, it's not just like, hey, if you're not attracting your dream life, you need to try harder. It's actually, you know, there's, there's other things at play there that have nothing to do with your mentality. One of the things that I've seen, um, is if manifestation isn't working for you, you might be, like, blocking new opportunities or good things from coming into your life, which means they, I've also seen them called, like, resistances. So, it means, basically, you're personally responsible for your failures, and it's not up to, you know, it's not up to chance, it's not up to any systemic barriers, it's not up to the actions of other people, maybe. Or maybe not, maybe, maybe I'm just assuming that. Anyway, the way I see it no, is I think there's that, merit to it. Yeah, the way I see it is, if you're viewing it like this, then you're personally responsible for your failures, and I'm not sure if this completely discounts the idea of systemic barriers, of other people's actions, of chance, and all that. But you sort of get into this logical fallacy of circular reasoning where if you aren't manifesting personal and social change, then your problems such as, you know, barriers to prosperity and better mental health, like, it won't get better. But if you're struggling with these barriers such as, you know, poor mental health, socioeconomic status, racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, then taking the steps in the first place to change those things will be harder. I think that's part of the reason that the idea that there exists a universal law of attraction is so appealing because when things are so far out of your personal control but you want to be able to change those things, then you might want to believe that just by putting that intention out into the world, things will get better. You know, like if you're feeling powerless, maybe if you are powerless, then at least you're doing something to change the world. So in my opinion, I guess the moral of this story is that whether or not manifestation and the law of attraction is, you know, like metaphysically real, this shouldn't prevent you from like putting in the work to personally better yourself and your community and also recognizing that like there are real barriers out there other than like yourself just like you don't need to blame yourself for all your problems which you know I have done in the past it's it's a very common thing among people and one of the things I like about law of attraction is that it is optimistic it means like you can change things but you know putting in the work to, you know, going to rallies, going to therapy, that sort of thing. That goes a long way to changing things. Mm -hmm. So I think kind of going off of that, it might be worthwhile to even just chat about, like, does law of attraction work? Um, because like you said, you know, like, a lot of it is about putting in the actual work yourself. So, you know, if, if you want to be rich, you still have to go to your job. Like, you can't just manifest money showing up at your door. Well, some people think you can. Um, but, you know, then when it comes to, like, can you manifest yourself out of racism, right? Like, those kind of things. Um, and I think, like, Rachel, you, you know a little bit more about, like, the psychology behind this, because I think, you know, if we're looking at it from, like, a religious perspective, it's not about necessarily saying if it's real or not. I mean, that's not what we do here. But, like, from, like, an actual, like, can you do it from a scientific perspective. I think we can talk a little bit about... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, first of all, um, I do want to say, like, there's no scientific evidence that the metaphysical law of attraction and manifest manifestation is real or works. Uh, but I want to talk about, like, some of the ways, some of the science behind the phenomenon and why people believe in it. So, one of these things you have in psychology is called a cognitive bias. A cognitive bias is basically like, it's, a, it's a, an umbrella term for a bunch of different types of biases, which are basically like preconceptions which affect your way of processing information and affect your uh, future thoughts and actions. So, 
one of the biases that would probably contribute to uh, believing in and using manifestation would be the illusion of control, which is, you know, the tendency for people to overestimate their ability to control events. So, you know, people would have this illusion of being able to manipulate um, chance or the universe to be able to control outcomes when there's no demonstrable evidence that they can influence those things. So another one is apophenia. I hope I pronounced that right, which is the tendency to perceive meaningful connections between seemingly unrelated things. So basically looking for patterns in information, which you could be doing if you were seeing connections between what you're manifesting and what's showing up in your life. Another one, which I think some people are more likely to have heard of, is confirmation bias, which is the tendency to search for, interpret, favor, and recall information in a way that supports your beliefs about something. So, if you believe a stereotype about somebody, some group, and then you see that a person from that group enacting a stereotype then this is probably just going to confirm your previous belief that they, the group of people fits that stereotype. So that would be an example of confirmation bias. And then the last one is expectancy theory. So expectancy theory says that um, an individual will behave or act in a certain way because they are motivated to select specific behaviors to create specific results. So basically expectancy theory is the idea is behind the idea of self-fulfilling prophecies and the placebo effect which you're going to hear it's self-fulfilling prophecy and the placebo effect more often than you're going to be experiencing you're going to be hearing expectancy theory. So from a scientific standpoint is it real? I mean, you could argue that law of attraction does exist through the power of the mind and the workings of one or multiple cognitive biases. Illusion of control can lead to your practicing manifestation. Expectancy theory can influence the actions you take to achieve your success. Apophenia can affect the ways you see manifestation working in your life, and then confirmation bias explains the cementation of your belief in the power of law of attraction. In other words, intentional manifestation of your goals is more likely to sharpen your focus towards them and encourage you to take the steps to manifest those goals yourself. So, if this, mana if this method of manifestation works well for you months, you are much more likely to try it again. So that's from the scientific psychological standpoint. So is, is it real? Sort of, yeah. So I think then like the next question is like, if you're, if you're maybe looking at it from like a religious standpoint or even that kind of occult magic standpoint that I think a lot of people draw from like the origins of this kind of you put it out into the universe and like change the spiritual energy to kind of give you what you desire right um I kind of of course we're not gonna necessarily say if a religion's real or not like I just said a minute ago but I found an article from the Theosophical Society it's on the American Theosophical Society's website that a lot of people that practice manifestation and law of attraction and use this kind of quote-unquote occult magic, um, they aren't necessarily thinking about the ramifications and the trickle-down effect of it. So aside from the fact like, yeah, it's real, it works, but does it work in the way that you think it does, right? So it seems that a lot of people use this for personal gain. So again, it's, you know, how can I become rich? How can I heal myself? How can I change this for myself? It's never about like, how can I change this for somebody else? So then people just don't address the fact that when you do kind of call on these magic powers um, 
and these energies, how does it then affect the other people around you? So for me to become rich, that means that I'm maybe taking money from somebody else, right? So like, you know, if my favorite thing to do is crap on capitalism. So let's throw this into this episode too. Why not? Um, you know, so like, obviously Jeff Bezos is rich at the cost of other people. So you could say like, maybe he manifested his wealth and his financial security, but in order to do so, it also affected all the people around him and his employees because, you know, he was taking money from them, for an example, right? So there's something to kind of be said as well about, like, when we look at the history of law of attraction and manifestation, it doesn't necessarily keep into account, like, the large-scale ramifications that maybe other, like, historical religious traditions would have. So, you know, for Christianity, like, the core Christian belief systems are not selfishly motivated. So, like, when you ask God to bless you with certain things, if he doesn't, maybe the kind of fallout of that is just like, well, maybe I'm not meant to have this because something else is at play in, like, a larger sense, right? Um, which is kind of doesn't seem to be mirrored in the contemporary law of attraction manifestation realm. I would also say, like, even if you are using manifestation and the law of attraction for, like, the greater good, I mean, your intentions could be good, but that's still gonna, you know, it could still take away from someone. Like, say, if we're using the money example, I want my friend to be able to afford rent this month. So they find, like, you know, maybe a hundred dollar bill on the ground. Well, that was somebody's hundred dollar bill that they lost. Maybe they can't afford rent this month or whatever. Um, or, you know, it could be an even more complicated example than that. There's you... issues with literally everything. Like, every single action that you do has some sort of negative reaction, no matter what. There's nothing that's, like, authentically good in the world. I'm a nihilist. What can I say? <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, there's a balance of good and evil, uh, you know, dark and light in the universe. I guess the law of attraction has to obey that as well yeah all right so maybe uh to close up have, have any of us ever used law of attraction in our own lives i've had to do lots of personal goal setting for jobs which has always been really fun i guess <laughs> set more specific goals jacqueline <laughs> <laughs> what about you rachel Wait, has it worked, Jacqueline? Um, I would say that it worked in that my supervisor did uh, constant checkups. And since she made me quantify my goals of like how many times a week I was going to do something that like maybe didn't need to be quantified, um, I was very much pressured into making it work. So <laughs> in that way, yes. Um, other goal setting, other more helpful goal setting um, has, I would say also worked. Um, I like to do a goal setting. Um, there's, um, there's this idea of kind of like this self care wheel. And so then you like, you have this image of a pie kind of, and you divide it up of like different areas that you want to make sure that you're caring for your self care. Um, and so, um, yeah, and then you can, like, fill in the pie as you, like, do it. So you can do it, like, every day or every week. Um, I like to make my goal setting um, after this, this experience of, like, super specific goal setting. I, I like to do it so that it's um, a little bit more uh, fluid and that it can fit better with, like, how my week is actually going. And so that I don't feel, like, um, I don't know, just, like annoyed at the goal setting, but then it can be something that's more productive and something that um, I think about more positively, in which case then the, these uh, these goals then become more positive than, um, yeah, than when they're forced upon me. So I guess, I guess in that way, that could be linked to law of attraction. If you think about like going in with like a positive mindset, um, that can cause positive changes um, in, in specifically in this case, self-care. But no, I haven't specifically done Law of Attraction. That makes sense, though. Like, I especially feel you on, like, the goal-setting thing. I hate goals. Uh, mm -hmm. It just makes me not want to 
achieve them. So yeah. even like when I set them myself, I'm just like, I don't want to do that anymore. Um, so a law of attraction in that sense, I guess is working because if I don't want to do them, I'm not going to achieve them. Um, but I've also used like crystals. I sometimes carry them around. I've got a different bunch. I've got a bunch of different types. Um, and I don't really believe in them so much in like the metaphysical sense, but I believe in them more like in the psychological sense. So like if I carry around um, quartz, for example, that's a very popular one. Uh, I will feeling in my pocket during the day or remembering that it's there or something will, you know, help me feel or remind me to like clear my mind or something like that. I think that's the definition or the meaning of quartz, but you know, it's less like, um, less like a, a belief in like the vibrational aspects of crystals and more in like, um, reminders to, you know, take care of my mental health in certain ways via the visual cue of crystals. What about you, Steph? Not really. I mean, I think, um, kind of like we, you guys have both been saying, it, it's hard to not, like, use something like manifestation or law of attraction at all, um, but I would say that, like, doing things that I would specifically call that, no, um, I've been intrigued by it, though. I mean, I was the one that brought up this episode because I thought it would be an interesting thing to learn more about. But I think I have always been a little bit scared of the power it can hold. Um, and maybe that's me getting into more of my uh, spiritual side that I don't usually show too often on the podcast. But, like, I, I honestly believe that, like, you can affect the energies around you and the energies of other people. Um... And I think that there's a lot of power in that that you can hold. So I think you need to tread lightly with it. You know what I mean? Um, and again, I don't normally get a, a, that that uh, introspective in in the podcast, but that's a little insight into me as a person. I like I'm it. I'm very scared of the powers of the energy, the powers of the energetic waves that surround us. <laughs> I want to hear more about spiritual stuff. <laughs> now, do you really? <laughs> I've just basically turned myself into an inability to do anything because I'm scared of the spiritual ramifications. <laughs> yeah. That sucks. Well, now it's you okay. know that I have can... mental health issues that I need to deal with, so it's just fine. <laughs> well, true. Feel that. <laughs> Regardless of whether law of attraction is real or not, like quote unquote real or not, we should all be giving ourselves credit for when we reach our goals and the steps we took to get us there. Even if you believe like you put something out into the universe and it came to you, chances are you did a lot of work too to help you get there. And I think there's a lot of power in acknowledging and congratulating yourself on your personal strengths and hard work and being a positive role model for others. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Nearly Numinous. For full transcripts of every episode, check out nearlynuminous.ca. There, you can also find links to subscribe to us on any of your favorite podcast platforms. Have a topic you'd like us to talk about, or would you like to be a guest on a future episode? Reach out to us at nearlynuminous at gmail.com. That's spelled N-E-A-R-L-Y-N-U-M-I-N-O-U-S at gmail.com.